Hello, I'm Vito Russo. Hi, I'm Marcia Pally. Last week, we spoke about the issue of racism in the gay and lesbian community. Tonight, we're going back to the third world community, not to take a look at the issue of white racism, but to look, take a look at the culture have constructed, organized, and made for themselves. We're going to be talking uh, to two women who are active in the Harlem lesbian community. We'll hear a performance piece on the flute by a member of the Black Heart Collective. And we'll be talking to uh, one of the founders of a gay student organization at Hostos Community College. Vito? Also tonight on Our Time, I'll talk to Cherie Moraga, who is a Chicana lesbian writer and one of the founders of Kitchen Table Women of Color Press, and also one of the editors of A Bridge Called My Back, writings by radical women of color. Also tonight, Renee McCoy went up to the Harlem community and talked to a lot of the third world people involved in Harlem gay life. And a little later, we're going to be listening in on a great conversation between Renee and Enrique Joan, who runs Jay's Bar in Harlem. And they're going to talk about gay life in Harlem then and now. Right now, we'd like you to take a look at the first answer in a series of answers to our question of the week, why is it that more third world lesbians and gay men are not involved in the gay liberation movement. Stay with us. That uh, there's a reason why a lot of third world people don't participate in the gay liberation movement or why we don't see more third world people involved in gay liberation? Be, uh, I see it this way because um, we've been um, kicked around by our own people. We've been like, I mean, we walk in a place sometimes and we all, the only thing we receive is attitude. I mean, it's like, they look down at you and I know what they're thinking. They'll say, what is he doing here? He doesn't belong here. Even, you know, no matter where am I from, what borough, and um, to be real here, I, I come from the ghetto. I was raised in the ghetto and it was real rough. And as for me, I mean, it's been really hard here in New York because it's like all this, um, put up like a plasticness, this attitude that you receive from people, but I learned that the attitude that they give me, I'll just come out and be nice to them and then they'll like, oh, then they'll come right down to earth. I said, baby, you should start it from the get-go. back, in a moment, you're going to be meeting Cherie Moraga. One of her projects with Kitchen Table Press was to republish Narratives by Cheryl Clark. Originally self-published by Cheryl Clark, Narratives is, are poems in the tradition of black women. And I think that you're going to really enjoy the next part of our program because we've got a specially produced poem called Ruby the Runaway, which was produced for our time, and it stars Cher uh, Cheryl Clark's sister, Brina Clark, and it's an extraordinary piece of work that you're going to take a look at right now. Women excite me and move me in the way those old midnight conferences with my rebel sister Ruby made my childhood memorable. Ruby left me for what she said won't even be a minute, and it turned into 14 years. And I mourned my sentence to the cell of my parents, wishing Ruby would come back and bust me out. My father gave me cigarettes from his commissary chest of drawers for the violence of his sex. And my mother allowed me to smoke them for colluding her silence. With a cigarette between my fingers, I practiced adulthood in front of my mirror daily. I was grown, but not like Ruby, who never satisfied herself with symbols. For the sake of appearances, my mother made cold predictions. First cigarette, then alcohol, then sex, then DD, or pregnant or a bulldagger like that black Ruby. Well, I've had it all, except been pregnant or a bulldagger. Still long for Ruby's soft buzz against my ear, cried to be black and grown like Ruby, to have my sentence commuted, 
to be protected from my father's intrusion and my mother's indifference. Escape was imminent. Amidst my father's threats to keep my hem below my knees, to sit with my legs together, and my mother's admonition never to let the roots of my hair revert, and to ignore the male need to call me out of my name in the street. I became engaged to Claude when I was only 16. Something Ruby was too wild to do. Claude was arrogant, intrusive, and clumsy. He was dumb and impudent and never understood my body's resistance. Well, I went to work and lied about my salary. Upon being told to hand over my check for the joint account, I rebelled. Claude snatched my pocketbook, fished out the check, saw my net was $10 more than his, and beat me with my pocketbook from the living room floor to the bathroom tile. That ass whipping amazed me to the point of calling the police, calling for the courage of Ruby's big fist. Claude nearly broke my nose with the telephone receiver, locked me in the bathroom, and answered the door. I heard him assure the police, we were having an argument, not a fight. The front door opened and shut. The closet door opened. His footsteps faded from where I sat in terror and indifference. Ten minutes. I rushed out his name. No answer. Euphoria. Hysteria. Twelve hours in that bathroom, recalling Ruby's escape, I made decisions. I heard the front door open. I did not start. Straight to the bathroom he came to relieve his bladder. Pushed my rigid body off the toilet seat where I had begun to live in that twelve-hour isolation. Shit was regal, dull dexterity. And clumsy Claude could not do two things at once, like grab me and pee. I was out. He was in. I locked him in. He was noisy to me out, and so was I. Out, out, out. Run into Ruby. Women excite me and move me in the way those old midnight conferences my rebel sister Ruby made my childhood memorable. I'm sitting with Cherie Moraga, a longtime activist and organizer in the third world feminist community, one of the editors of This Bridge Called My Back, a major catalyst in galvanizing the third world lesbian uh, feminist community into collective action. And she has a new book of poems, stories, and essays, which is going to be coming out this fall from South End Press, called Loving in the War Years. Welcome, Cherie. I'm really glad you could I'm be glad here. glad to be here. Good. Yeah. I want to, this is a, it's been a long journey for you, sort of, to, uh, to be who you are today. I guess it's, it's a long journey for everybody, you know, to be who they right. are at this moment in their lives. But it would be really nice if we could spend some time talking about your development uh, and consciousness as a writer with all the issues in your life. When, you, when did you first start writing? And w when, when you first started writing, did you sort of start writing with a consciousness of who you were as a lesbian and as a Chicano Hardly. lesbian? Right. Well, I, it is, I mean, I think you know this too, being a writer, that the, I mean, the, the progress is slow and painfully rot and <laughs> everything else. Um, when I first started, I mean, I started writing, in fact, I was just talking to a friend about this, describing, the kinds of things I wrote in college, which was when I really started to write. When I went into college, I had not read completely one full book. Uh. You know, I mean, I sort of talked my way through high school, et cetera, et cetera. So I had a lot of catching up to do and never wrote until, until college. And basically, I wrote these, like, incredibly self-hating, homophobic, mm. you know, fi pieces of fiction, you know, right. short stories. And I, I saved them. Um, 
but uh, basically, you know, during those years, they, since I, um, although I had known for many years, of course, since I was a kid that I was a lesbian, that's n nothing I came to terms with until, you know, like in, when I was about 20. And in fact, you know, the day I came out, all of this writing came up, you know, that had never come up before. I mean, there's just a level in which if you take yourself seriously as a writer and you have to censor something that's so basic in you, you're going to be writing crap, you yep. know, and it was really crap, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that, so in terms of like, you know, the, my consciousness as a lesbian, none of that is like, was planned or anything, it just, it, when I actually did in fact come out, something was released in me so that I could write much more honestly, mm -hmm. you know, and of course I began writing these very passionate love poems and that's how they first right. started, yeah. but um, the political consciousness attached you know, to being a lesbian, being a Chicana, you know, I feel is still an ongoing, you know, long ongoing process. Right. You know? So what was, what was the coming out process as a lesbian like? I mean, was it this enormous revelation? It seldom is for people, you know, a quick mm -hmm. revelation, but was there a time in your life when politically you knew that now you were a lesbian identified woman, uh, um, as opposed to before where the feelings were just inside of you and they were right. going to come out? Uh, well, I think that, I mean, I, I'm 30 years old, and given the timing in which I came out, I was very lucky um, mm. because of feminism. You know, right. I mean, one of the things that kept me a long time um, from coming out, which also affected, you know, my inability to write about lesbian issues, um, was because, you know, my sense of it was is that if I, you know, I came out, I'd die. I mean, I really did believe that, you know, not seeing any kind of, like, way in which to safely, you know, be gay. Yeah. And feminism um, did not bring me out. You know, I'm not one of those women who came out in the movement, right. <laughs> which is perfectly legitimate. Um, but that it was a way in which I, 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 for the first time, met women who were lesbians who weren't dying. You right. know, I mean, from the way I could see it. You know, who had, you know, who, who had vision, who wanted something. You right. know, it didn't mean you were going to end up shot up in the gutter somewhere, which was my own homophobic, right. you know, fantasies. Right. So the, the movement politicized my lesbianism, but at the same time, I always felt that um, that the way I experienced my lesbianism, which was so specifically sexual, I mm -hmm. mean, from such an early age, feminism ve did very little to say that that was legitimate. I mean, suddenly lesbianism got very cleaned up and, you know, and yep. so I felt like, well, I'm even queer within the movement, right. you know, and um, certainly then when, r when race issues became all the more parents among people that you need who are mm -hmm. lesbians and, and gay men. When race, we start to, to, to see race differences, um, then there's another kind of disillusionment that comes with that, you yeah. know. So, so actually my coming out um, through feminism sort of made me aware of what was missing. Right. You know. Right. What about publishing for the first time? I mean, when you first started looking around to publish the things that you really, I mean, you know, once you start writing something that's in your gut, like you get so naked, mm -hmm. you know, it takes a lot of courage to write from who you really are because you're taking a chance. And did you run into all sorts of uh, problems in publishing it in so either feminist uh, or mainstream presses? N not actually. I mean, b Bridge coming out was, um, a very, very lucky break. I mean, would I account, you know, I had done some publishing before, but in like small journals, etc. Mm -hmm. But Bridge was my first book. And it was politically very timely, you know, within the women's movement, because everybody was, you know, there were some people that all along had been very concerned about racism within the women's movement and in general, you know. But of course, also it became a very hot item right. within the women's movement, and I think the parallels also exist within the gay men's movement. So here we were, third world lesbians, but the co-editor is also a lesbian, uh, Gloria Ansaldua. And although the book is not all um, by lesbians, third world lesbians, um, you know, at least half the people are. Right. And um, so at the time in which the book, we began to compile this book, which came out of reaction to the racism within the lesbian and, and the feminist communities originally. Right. Um, it, was, it was perfect timing, right? right. I mean, it's so, so white feminist p 
pub, you know, publishing houses were interested in it because of the political, again, timing of it, you know. And yet white feminist publishing houses didn't publish it. I mean, well, Persephone Press did, which oh. is a which is a feminist house. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, there and there was a left press that was interested in it as uh -huh. well. Uh -huh. You know, so um, they did publish it, um, but I think that one of the things that and the process was a very was it ended up being a very decent yes. process. Um, but what the nuances, however, of being a third world person having to publish in a white, whether it be left, alternative, Harper and Raw, whatever, yeah. you know, is that you take the sort of racism you're going to have to experience as a given, yeah. you know, and um, particularly since the voices of the women in Bridge were so, there were so many different kinds of voices given that there was, you know, black women, Asian American, Native American, Latina, et cetera. Um, and what, what happened is that it put me for the first time in a position to realize one of the reasons I can publish this damn book with these people is because I can talk their language, right? That yeah. there's certain ways in which I've been assimilated enough or educated enough or whatever enough so right. that I can like translate what it is they want to hear and make right. it, package it right and do all this kind of thing, yeah. you know? And in fact, it made me very aware of the women of color I knew and that I knew that I did not know who were very good writers who, because they didn't have those quote, skills, right. you know, would never have access to publishing, right. you know, and that in fact this is a token situation. Yeah. You know, I don't think any woman of color who publishes in, you know, any, any kind of publishing um, thinks for a minute she's not a token. You know, yeah. you just sort of like capitalize on the tokenism in the hopes that it can make a little room for other people. Right. One know? of the astounding things about Bridge is that it retains those voices. You know, I mean, it didn't go through this sort of meat grinder of, right. you know, leveling everything out into one sort of acceptable academic forum mm -hmm. voice, you know, where the voices of the women are real, you know, yeah. raw, you know, and, and that's, that's one of the most extraordinary things about the book, I think. Mm -hmm. What about? Well, what I wanted to say to yeah. that, too, is that I have to credit um, Persephone um, Press, who published the book, in the sense of giving us as editors complete control of that. You know, I mean, they did not try to edit out the language, whitify the language. I mean, the bottom line for us was we get to, we get to say how it's going to sound. Yeah. And there's other, you know, feminist publishing houses and other houses as well that never would have let that happen. Right. You know, with um, some other book like But Some of Us Are Brave, which is a, a book about black uh, women's study. It was a, this is here, um, that that book went through a lot of battles with the editors in relationship to the publishing house of trying to keep the integrity of the black women's voices, you know, intact, mm -hmm. you know. So it mm -hmm. certainly is not a given that your that you're publisher gonna. says, yes, honey, anything you say is fine and say exactly. it whatever way you want to say it. Exactly. So. We should talk a little bit about Kitchen Table Press because uh, more and more people know about Kitchen Table Press, but I don't think they know uh, how it was formed and what the concept was and how well it's working, mm -hmm. you know, and what it's published and stuff. Right. Well, th actually, the, the story of, of, you know, my personal publishing with Persephone is, a, is kind of a case in point because what happened is um, the people who originally got together to discuss Kitchen, you know, the possibility of having a third world women's press right. were women who had published in other publishing you know, areas, whether it be like Audre Lorde, for instance, is, a, is part of Kitchen Table Press, and a, as a black lesbian poet, she had published with Norton, right? Plus, black, during the 60s, you know, small black presses, and had also published um, with feminist presses. And all of her various experiences in those areas, Barbara Smith had published with the feminist press, and also with Conditions Magazine, which is a feminist press. Everybody uh, numbers of other women as well. We all kind of came together with our sometimes positive, sometimes horrible stories about our publishing experiences, but always with the understanding that we were not the top priority for any publishing house in this country. Right. You know, that it was like we could not be dependent on their whim, mm -hmm. you know. And even if Kitchen Table could only manage to publish two books a year, mm -hmm. you know, that the existence of us you know, politically would have some impact for other women of color who are trying to write, that at least there's some place that puts us first, right. you know. Right. And that's basically how it came about. Um, 
the the press now has expanded a, a great deal. We are in New York City, um, and Narratives, which is the book you know that you Cheryl's. just yeah, Cheryl's book, is the first book that we distributed and now are republishing. Our first uh, full title is um, Cuentos Stories by Latinas, and that will be coming out in June, this coming June. Um, I heard rumors about uh, Latina, lesbian oh, anthology. Right. Compañeras, is, is yeah. That right? Well, this is a, Cuentos is a different, Cuentos is, <coughs> is a, uh, a book of stories um, that has lesbian and straight writers, and it's bilingual in English and in Spanish. Compañeras is a, a project that has been in the works for a long time, edited by uh, Juanita Ramos and Mirta Quintanales, and they are both New York Latinas living uh -huh. in New York and wonderful women. Um, and Compañeras is, is indeed a Latina lesbian anthology because Juanita's idea, she was tired of within the Puerto Rican community and within the white community, everybody saying that there was no such thing as a Latina lesbian <laughs> or we inherited it from white people. So she went out and this girl got interviews from every, le I mean, every kind of um, lesbian, every like geographical region, yeah, yeah. you know, every age, every yeah. sensibility, feminist, not feminist, I mean, and they're like, the bulk of it is interviews, and it's a wonderful book, and uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to put it out. You know, oh, that's fabulous! In the, in the coming year. This time goes so, so. quickly, and like we have maybe a minute, but uh, really, I, you know, that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you used to live in California, and now right. you live in New York. Right. Um, you're you're going to stay here and keep writing in New Quien York. Quién sabe? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You miss the sunshine. I miss. Uh, well, I miss you know, I miss the ocean. I miss the life there. You know, but. Um, New York has been a wonderful place um, in terms to do my writing. I mean, and politically, it's been an incredibly supportive community. So I can't complain about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so. I want to, like, in, in the few seconds we have left, just thank you for being visible. And also, not only for being visible, there was something I wanted to get into in this that we haven't gotten into, but for giving people uh, the value of not passing, mm -hmm. uh, of claiming who they are. Yeah, right. which is real important and needs yes. a lot of discussion, you know, yeah. about taking who you are and not allowing people to ignore it. Exactly. Yeah, you I know. think that's probably the subject of another interview, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but, but bless you for being here. Thanks. And I was stay very out glad there, to be here. Because I'm glad you're out there and so are a lot to. of other people. Thanks. Uh, I want to thank Cherie and I want to ask you to please stay tuned for um, another interview which will fascinate you. If you've just joined us, we are spotlighting third, third world lesbian and gay community on our time tonight. And Renee McCoy did a number of interviews in the Harlem gay community this week. And right now you're going to be taking a visit with her with Enrique Joan, who is the proprietor of Jay's Bar in Harlem. And you're going to learn a little bit about what gay life was like in Harlem 20 years ago and what gay life is like in Harlem right now. So stay around. Metropolitan Community Church with Enrica Joan. Enrica is a manager of one of Harlem's gay spots called Jay's over on 125th Street. I tell you, I, it's the spot that I go to in Harlem since I live up here. How you doing, Ricky? Hi there, how are you? Ricky, you've been a part of Harlem's black gay community for quite some time. How do you feel about being black and gay in Harlem today as opposed to, say, 15 years ago? Well, um, I feel that 15 years ago that the gay community was much better, much more refined. We at that particular time tend to work forward to being good in whatever we did. There was a lot of respect. We weren't too heavily into drugs, and etc., as, as they are today. And all the way around, I just think it was better 15 years ago than it is today. Do you think that gays in Harlem worked more together as a body, say 15, 20 years ago? Today? You're... Than they do today. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. 15 years ago, they definitely worked much more together than they do today. Uh, uh, there is very 
you have little groups here and little groups there uh, that may tend to work together. But as a whole, say 15 or more years ago, uh, they were all together, preferably, because they didn't have many places to hang out. They didn't have many places, many things to do. So as a result, they tend to, to work together because they did have, they want to secure it. And they tend to further their education and uh, into something because they knew that they had to be good about whatever they did. What did black gays do 20 years ago? Where did we go? Well, basically, 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, everyone went to each other's home. Um, uh, we would take a cab and we would call up Renee and say, Renee, we all coming over. We would get a bottle and we would go over to Renee's house and we would party there until uh, the wee hours of the morning. And uh, if we got a companion, we would either go wherever we could. Most of the time, uh, you know you, that you couldn't take them home, not to your parents, because they wouldn't tolerate it. You know, sometimes I, I go in um, Jay's, and as a lesbian, I wonder where the black lesbians, how come they don't party together? Um, how come black lesbians don't come into Jay's or Andre's? Well, you see, Renee, there are some that do come to see me, more or less, uh, if you allow me, on your category, mature, conservative. But then on the other scale, you have the more younger ones, which that, technically speaking, are about nothing. Uh, most of them migrate from wherever, Long Island and wherever they come here. And I'm not saying that they sh maybe they shouldn't or they should, but I feel that if you gonna project that you're a lesbian, four months later, why are you pregnant? <laughs> yeah. You know, so that tends to tarnish lesbian, and which cause a lot of confusion among the homosexual. Because now I cannot trust Renee. Because no two female can make a baby. No matter how hard we try. No matter how hard you try. <laughs> no matter what operations you may do. You, know you cannot. As opposed to two men. Not either. Well, you know, when I came out, um, black lesbians and gays, of course, I'm from the country, but black lesbians and gays, we, we seem to be more together. We, we hung out together. We were friends. We did things together. What happened? Thought somewhat alike. Yeah. And did a whole lot of things and agreed with it. Do you think we'll ever be like that again, where, where, where black lesbians and black gay men can, can come together? This is, do you think that this is, this is typical of us? It, it seems to me like, like it's not. We didn't always be so separate, men and women. Well, you know? um, like again, I say, using you as a problem, people that are more or less in your category. I love that. If we that. group someplace, if we could get in touch with each other, we're so out of touch, and we could get in touch with each other and says, hey, we're going to hang in J's, fine, that would be. But this uh, last 10, 12-year-old uh, lesbian or this last 10, 12 year old homosexual. They are out of touch so far, they would know reality if it slapped them in the face. Ricky, do you think the uh, Harlem community is any more anti lesbian and gay 15, 20 years ago? Do you think it's easier to be a openly gay man in Harlem than it is to be an openly gay man in Brooklyn? Well, now, that depends upon the individual. You will also find, being that you just took up residential here in Harlem, that um, all boroughs drain here into Harlem. Most people see these type of thing going on 125th Street, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me. They tend to think that these people are from Harlem, but they're not from Harlem. They're from 
Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx, everywhere else. And most of the troublemakers, uh, the ones that result into the trouble, are not from Harlem. Now, you live in Harlem, right? I've lived in Harlem quite a few years. 124th and Park Avenue. Do you get any kind of um, harassment from your neighbors because you're gay? No, I don't. Then you have to take in consideration I'm an because, number one, I don't place myself in that category. I'm not saying that underneath the breath or underneath the chest, around the door, hallway, I'm not spoken on. But I take care of myself in such a manner that you would have to be retarded or ill yourself to not respect <laughs> what I'm about. Do you feel that our sexuality interferes with what we accomplish as if you hadn't been gay you would have not had life as hard no no I don't feel that again I'm a total different individual my parents accepted me you know I got static out of my father for a few years but, again, 15 or 20 years ago, <clears throat> we forced ourselves to respect ourselves. And we went to school. We had to have the best grades. When we went out, we had to be clean, immaculate, whatever. Our rooms was kept in order. If it was your turn to wash dishes, mother didn't have to tell Renee, it's your turn. Renee knew, and Renee did this. Renee also knew that when she came from school that she had to get out of homework before she go out with her girlfriends. She knew this. So basically, we did out. We had all different type of values, as opposed to today, we don't have these. So what I hear you saying um, is that what, what our problem is in the, in the black, lesbian, and gay community is a sense of self-worth. Right. More so than what is going on in the community. And loving you as a person and respecting you as an individual. This portion of our time is brought to you by Christopher Street Magazine. There's a reason why a lot of third world people don't participate in the gay liberation movement or why we don't see more third world people involved in gay liberation? Um, well, I'm not really aware of the how much participation there is. I, I'm not involved in any movement, but if I would project, then I would say that there is uh, definitely a racial thing in the gay, you know, gay society. Being black and gay myself, I know personally that a lot of people seem to have a problem with dealing with their I can't understand why, because we are all indeed a minority on one level or another. They want to be with their own color instead of with mixed, you know, a mixed crowd. Do you think that there's sort of just as much bad feeling to, about race in the gay community as there is in the straight community? I would say yes with that one. Yeah. Yeah. I feel if you're all the same kind of type of person, that there should be no racism at all. You know, it's you're all the same person, you should get along together. That's the way I feel. You no, know, like with third world, um, it's hard to socialize in a more, you know, upper-class crowd. But then as far as, you know, communication, I communicate well with all gays, you know, as, um, you know, like I find most gays t tend to get along, you know.
Hi, uh, you're back in the studio and I'd like to take a minute to tell you what's coming up on our show. We're going to be talking to Eartha Carroll and Kayshawn Holmes, two women involved in Harlem's lesbian community. And incidentally, Kayshawn is a gunnery sergeant in the U.S. Marines. We'll also be hearing a piece on the flute performed by Fred Carl. And right now, Renee McCoy talks to Lisa Roca. Lisa is one of the founders of Gay Love, a gay student organization that was formed on Hostos Community College campus. Let's take a look at Renee McCoy and Lisa Roca. When you uh, started Gay Love, why, what brought that on? Why did you feel that organization at the college? I have been at the college now for approximately a year and a half, dealt with many different individuals in the college, and noticed that there are many homosexuals that once again are in the closet. They are so fearful of what mechanics might do to them if they say they are homosexuals, that they have to be very quiet. They are lonely people. If they have problems, whether it is with a professor or a student, they really have to re always remain alone. They have no one to go to, no one to help them with maybe a problem that they may have at home, or like I said before, within the college themselves, they may have problems. I started to look at all of these little different issues that are, were occurring in the school and have been discussing it with one of my friends. Well, why not us? So many CUNY systems have a homosexual organization. Why not hostos? I feel it would not only benefit the homosexuals, but the heterosexuals as well, because they would be enlightened and would know exactly what the word homosexual means and not immediately fear it. And this was one of the problems that we had in hostos, where as soon as we mentioned that we were going to try to start Gay Love, our organization, within two days it became a scandal. We had to actually sit down with many people, faculty members and students, and explain to them that this is an educational club, not a conversion club. We're not trying to convert the heterosexual into a homosexual. We're trying to show them and enlighten them what the word homosexuality is, and how you deal in society, how you would deal professionally. And because it is a college, we are going to college to know what is evolving around the world whether it is in different professions or in human relations, definitely most in human relations, because to have any position in this world, you must know how to deal with people, regardless what their color, race, or sexual preference is. Basically, the white liberation, the gay liberation movement has been a white gay liberation movement. Why do you think that is? Or Hispanics involved in lesbian and gay liberation? Throughout the years, the whites have always been dominant over the minority. That includes Hispanics and blacks. Whether it is gay or whether it is any other issue that is proposed, we are always behind. We have that upper hand class over us. Do you think that there's room for Hispanics and blacks and Asians in gay liberation? Yes, I do. We are all humans, whether we are whatever color. We're all humans, and I feel we all have a place. Well, for us to be there. This is that we attempt, not only because we're gay, but because we're minority. That's the main issue. I the homosexual fear of it and the taboo form that has been put upon us. But because we're basically more minority than our sexual preference, and this is something that we've encountered in every aspect of life, even in education. Do you go to the village much? Quite often. Is it any different being a Hispanic lesbian in the village than a in Harlem? Yes. <laughs> What's yes. the difference? Yes. In, ha in Harlem, they look at you like a pervert. If you say, well, in my case, you can't, I have no label, I don't dress the way I dress. So therefore, 
it's not that easy to see that I am a homosexual, I would have to say it. And when I do, immediately, one more time, there is harassment. While we're, when we're in the village, we are all one, whether we are white, whether we are black, we all become one. The lifestyles there, it's just accepted as an individual, a human being, and not a sex object in life. Do you think the uh, Harlem community, the so Spanish community, the black community, will ever be one with the homosexual? In the year 2000. <laughs> <laughs> That's not too far away. Well, I'm hoping that being accepted won't be too far away What either. do you think we as third world lesbians and gays have to do in order to get that oneness, that unity with our families and with our friends in the communities where we live? In the community, I feel that in this lesbianism, we have to start respecting each other. And we have to start doing for each other before we can show our relatives or the community that we are quote unquote homosexuals. And I feel once you show a person, well, I myself, I am Lisa Roca, I show them my intellectual ability, I carry myself with my children in my home, in my community. They tend to say, well, Lisa's a f really a go ahead woman. woman. But when I say I'm a homosexual, they look at me kind of funny. They don't say I'm bad because you're not going to contradict what you just said before. But yes, there are some that will accept me because I have shown them first that I am and not the homosexual that I am. And there are those that immediately will band me off. So do you think that is for us, third world lesbians and gay men, to continuously come out more in our own community? Yes, definitely. More in unity and unity not only amongst ourselves, but with the heterosexual and show them, not show them as far as clothing wise and verbal wise. Nothing really wrong with this lifestyle. We are still people. We are not animals. We are not something we were created. We are not freaks. We are individuals that have chosen our own lifestyle. That was Fred Carl, a member of the Black Heart Collective. Right now, we'd like to take a look at the third in a series of interviews conducted by Renee McCoy at Harlem's Metropolitan Community Church. There she talked to Eartha Carroll and Kayshawn Holmes. Eartha Carroll, in addition to her many activities in the lesbian community there, puts out a newsletter called Spotlight News. This tells its readers about important political events and also about such fun things as parties and discos. Kay Sean is also one of the founders of Gay Love, the gay student union at Hostos Community College that you just heard Lisa Roca talking about a few minutes ago on tape. 
Okay, let's take a look at Renee McCoy, Eartha Carroll, and Kayshawn Holmes. Eartha Carroll, the founder of the Total Women Productions, Sean Holmes, who is one of the co-founders of a new lesbian and gay organization called Gay Love. Eartha, the Total Women Productions. Okay. Total Women Production consists of women who have gotten together and uh, who shared the same concept and ideas, who are lesbian women as well as women who are not, and uh, who like social and political activities, are concerned on what's going on around them. We are women who are hoping to unify the women as one, to share our ideas, our concepts, our moral beliefs, and to take away some of the myths the taboos that have been handed down to us through uh, our socialization process. Well, it seems to me that I've always heard that black lesbians and black heterosexual women cannot, will not work together. Now, your production company seems, that, seems to dispel that myth. Yeah. What's it like to work with heterosexual women? No. Uh, I, I, I tend to disagree with that. I find that, number one, we tend to put ourselves in separate categories. Example, one, say, well, we're homosexual women, we're lesbian women, therefore, the heterosexual women are us. We are not. We are all women. We share a lot of the same things, the same problems, same abuse, child care, alcoholism, drug addiction. Um, I think what we need to do is take that phobia away and say that we are women and that the difference is that we have our preference, which is sexual preference. I like to refer to our women as women of preference as opposed to uh, uh, stereotype names such as lesbian. Um, however, it suits the purpose why we're here and things that we do. We are not very different. I enjoy working with heterosexual women because I don't believe that um, we are different. I find that our ideas and concepts are the same. Keyshawn. Yes. Keyshawn. Keyshawn. <laughs> Sorry about that. I understand you're also a uh, gunnery in the Marine Corps. That's right. Get out of here. How does it, are all lesbians, are there lesbians in the Marine Corps? Uh, there are lesbians everywhere. Uh, some people tend to think that the United States Armed Forces in its whole, whatever branch, that it basically consists of your and just male homosexuals to a very extent. Well, I understood that um, there were no black lesbians in the service. Huh. They are black lesbians in the service in every branch. Is that any different from being a white lesbian in the service? Okay, in the service, you do not experience uh, the racial discrimination as far as being a homosexual as a lesbian because you are looked upon, first of all, as an individual. For example, I'm looked at, I'm based on, as far as being a gunnery sergeant, Sergeant Holmes. They don't look at me for being or a black female first. They look at me for an individual. Do you believe that? Okay, well, they want us to believe that. Under the cover, uh, we, I have experienced that a lot of promotions that I have had were based on my sexual preference because they, as a female, as a lesbian, I would be able to uh, take on certain responsibilities. As an aggressor, they felt that I would be able to take on a lot of responsibilities and succeed. Does Uncle Sam know you're a lesbian? Uncle Sam, uh, okay, I have given many lectures, okay, so in that sense they know that I am a homosexual. What's it like being a black lesbian in the black community? Well, my experiences as a black lesbian have been good except for my family background which is a very religious Christian Pentecostal type of thing so automatically I have backslidden quote-unquote 
and I am living as far as an abominable life, as far as in God's eyesight. Now that is the only experiences as a black lesbian that I have experienced as far as negative reaction, okay? Because my growing up, my surroundings have always been either amongst the Hispanics, because my father is a Hispanic, or amongst the Caucasians, because the area I grew up in Arizona was just your Indian and your Caucasian community. How about you, Arthur? Um, I think uh, the experience of being a lesbian has been phenomenal because I am a mother as well. I'm a lesbian, I'm a lesbian mother. I have two children who are nine and ten. And uh, I've been married for 14 years and still is married. Um, the experience for me has been exciting and very rewarding, except that as part of life. Uh, I don't think they really know that there's a difference. Um, they function uh, just as well. They go to school. I tend to their needs just like a mother would attend to theirs. I think that they're a little bit more liberal than most heterosexual children, okay? Um, I find that it has been a very intellectual experience because I've gotten to learn a lot about my through other women who are lesbians and who are dealing with women of preference. Well, society can be very cruel. And so uh, I think it's the way you carry yourself and the fashion and the manner in which you deal with things. I am not what they would call, quote unquote, uh, aggressor who dresses totally in clothes. Okay, so I can att attend board meetings and political and rallies, and no one would uh, know the difference in terms of coming to my children and say, look, your mother is, you know, a bulldog or a dyke, in words that I think is very derogatory in terms of dealing with women. Um, I find all children are more acceptable of things than uh, adult human beings, okay? And if you take the time to explain things to them at the proper time, okay, I, I have to emphasize it, at the proper time, then yes, they can get along and you can have a very healthy relationship. I think basically their concerns is, mommy happy. If the gay rights bill were passed today, would that make a difference in any of your life? No. Not, not no. one difference. No. Um, you know, uh, the issue of the gay rights bill, to me, I think the reason it has not been passed because, okay, let's examine what is the gay rights bill for. If it gets passed, we're not going to be able to walk hand in hand in public. Right. We're not able, we're not going to be able to fornication in public. <laughs> we're not going to be married in a, in a church in public, okay? So the gay rights bill, if they would stipulate it and say, a equal rights bill in terms of if he makes $40,000 and he digs a ditch and I dig that same ditch with him and I make $40,000, then we have a bill, equal rights bill. But, you know, I think sometimes we get carried away. We go to Disneyland with mm -hmm. this gay rights, gay rights this, you know. I mean, what about your personal rights, the rights your children to live decently, you know, to avoid harassments. What about a human rights bill? I mean, we have that and we're still struggling with that. Uh, I don't see problems in the black community, in the Hispanic community about gay rights. Well, I think that's about it for our show tonight. That was fast. <laughs> and next week on Our Time, we're going to be interviewing an actual openly gay Broadway star. You'll meet Harvey Firestein in his dressing room backstage at Torch Song Trilogy, so remember to tune in for that. A few weeks ago on Our Time, we did a show on the politics of drag, and those of you who caught that show remember that you were introduced to Billy and Tiffany, a very funny and political drag entertainment act. And we're sorry to tell you that Billy Blackwell died in his sleep on April the 25th, and we'd like to extend our sympathy to his partner and friend Tiffany to the members of the New York gay theatrical community, and to the friends and the fans of Billy Blackwell, of whom we were and are among the, the, those numbers. So, so long, Billy. We're going to miss you a lot. Thank you, Vito. 
Um, a few weeks ago, we got a postcard from a member of Gay and Lesbian Youth of New York, and I'd like to read that postcard to you. It says, Dear Our Time, I enjoy your show very much. My mother hates it. Don't despair, just do a piece on parents of gays. Also, you can tell Manhattan Cable to get its transmission act together, and it's signed, Love Me. Well, thank you, me. If, uh, if any more of you would like to tell us how you feel about our time, we'd really appreciate hearing from you, especially now. Next week is our last show, and we're trying to get it together for some more shows, and your support and hearing from you would really mean a lot to us. Please send your notes or postcards or letters to Our Time, WNYC TV, 1 Center Street, New York, New York, 1007. There's one more thing I'd like to tell you before we close, and it's some good news. Uh, the book, The Color Purple, by f black feminist Alice Walker, has just won the P Pulitzer Prize for Literature. It received rave reviews in the gay press and in the mainstream press, and was reviewed in the New York Times. But one thing that you won't discover if you merely read the New York Times review is that The Color Purple is about two black lesbians. Let's hear it for complete coverage by the New York Times. I'm Marcia Pally, and for all of us in our time, good night. We're talking to people about why there aren't more people of color, third world people, involved in gay liberation movement. As far as heavily getting into it politically, um, I don't know how much it would, do, you know, how much good it would do because there's, there's still a barrier there. You know, people still perceive you no matter what. You know, I mean, I'm educated. You know, I have two degrees, and um, it really doesn't mean a, a bowl of beans. I meet people every day who say to me, you know, but well, you're nice, but you know, there's that area there. So.